I'd like to welcome you all to Wednesday's parallel session, number four of the 2021 Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. And here we're going to address theme two of the meeting, which is uh, Soil Biodiversity in Action. And this has a specific focus on the links with land restoration. So it's a great honor to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is Arwin Jones, and I'm from the European Commission's Joint Research Center. I'm a colleague of Alberto Orgiati, who gave a presentation in the plenary session just now. And I'll be moderating uh, the next uh, couple of hours with you. Uh, just to remind you of the arrangements for this afternoon, uh, we will have four presentations uh, in each hour, uh, 10 minutes each. And I'd really like to remind the presenters to keep to this uh, 10 minute interval. Uh, so we have plenty of time for some discussion and uh, questions and answers afterwards. Uh, I will remind you uh, at nine minutes uh, that we have one minute left and um, please try to, uh, to respect the, the time limitations. Uh, for all the other present, uh, participants, please have a look at the Q&A uh, instructions in the chat. Uh, please post your question uh, and please indicate the name of the presenter uh, to whom your question is addressed. And we'll try and uh, select a, a few of these for discussion afterwards. Uh, I would also urge the participants, if they can, uh, afterwards maybe to, to re-engage with uh, the other questions that we won't be able to address uh, in, this, uh, in this session and to, to engage with uh, the, the people afterwards. So the host of the meeting is Julia. Uh, she's here to, to help you, Julia Stanko. And if you have any technical problems, uh, please uh, send a nice message to meet you all. privately. Uh, so, without further delay, then I'd like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Giada Migliore from uh, Enea. Uh, that's the Italian National Agency for New Technologies, Energy, and Sustainable Economic Development. And she's going to tell us about her work on restoring the soil while preserving functions, a winning approach by exploiting microbial biodiversity. So, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, better. <laughs> I share my Can you see? Yeah. Maybe in presentation mode. Yeah, great. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, so uh, good afternoon. I present a winning approach to restore soil by exploiting native microbial biodiversity and preserving functions and natural equilibrium between uh, in the soil. As well known, soil is a non-renewable resource and degraded the soil recovery and remediation of soil contaminated by mining activities are strategic goal for European policies. Metals contaminated environments show a low microbial activity and reduce the soil functions. The discovery of new microorganisms, heavy metal resistant and able to promote plant growth may improve phytoremediation technologies for contaminated sites. Here I want to present to show the bacterial assisted phytoremediation performed in the abandoned mine of Ingurtoso in Sardinia and the monitoring activity carried out for seven years. Ingurtoso mine site was one of the largest and most productive mines of Spalerite and Galina in Sardinia. The plants closed in 1969. Today, Ingurtoso is a part of geological and mining park, and in 1997, it became one of the UNESCO networks of geoparks. The mine is inserted in a highly natural environmental and landscape context. In 2009, started the Umbrella project that aimed to experiment the combination of native microorganisms and plants for a phytoremediation assisted by microorganisms in five European mining sites. The area of Ingurtoso was formed by mine waste. According to the chemical analysis, it was poor in uh, total and organic carbon and nitrogen and uh, 
the heavy metal concentration was very high and their bioavailability was from 10 to 50 times higher than other mining soils. Native plants were typical of Mediterranean vegetation and among these, uh, Euphorbia pitiusa was chosen for further experiments uh, as well adapted to the local conditions and able to accumulate heavy metals in the leaves, so useful as a phytostabilizer. The cultivable fraction of soil bacteria was characterized. Among the 41 morphotypes, strains have been uh, identified and tested for plant growth promoting functions. 90% were nitrogen fixators, nitrogen fixers. 63% were siderophore producers, 44% phosphate mobilizer, and 32% phytohormones producers. The nine most performing strains were selected, cultivated in the laboratory, and then used for bioaugmentation in a consortium. All the bacteria isolated were collected in an EA MIRI strain collection, participated by European MIRI networks. The toolbox consisting of endemic plants and bacteria was firstly tested in a greenhouse pot experiment. The results supported the decision to proceed with a field trial. A 200 square meters area was divided into 27 subplots, and the experimental design included different treatments like bioaugmentation, mycorrhiza, and viromine in different combinations. Viromine is an alkaline byproduct of bauxite industry, obtained from the reaction between red mud and seawater. It was widely used for environmental remediation process due to its metal trapping capacity. The environment subplots were treated mixing 10% of amendment in the first 20 centimeters of soil. The field experiment started in October 2011. After transplanting, the field was regularly watered. At the start of the experimental field, the microbial activity was evaluated through biologue system. Microbial activity is a, an indicator of soil quality useful for uh, evaluate the effect of bioremediation strategy and the soil evolution by the community physiological profiling. From the graph, you can see that bioaugmentation had an immediate positive effect on the metabolic activity in the soil. Six months after the beginning of, uh, of the trial, an early assessment of the toolbox performances was carried out. As shown, despite the winter season, the plant survival was satisfactory. Soil quality was increased and by augmentation improved the microbial activity towards plant interaction by root exudates. Even if euphorbia alone positively influenced the microbial community in the rhizosphere, bacteria by augmentation further improved the microbial metabolic potential and its resilience, allowing the plant soil system to better overcome stress and critical conditions. Metal content decreased due to the leaching and the uptake by the plants. Viromine contributed to the reduction of metal concentration, but at the same time inhibited the plant growth. The metal content in the sh plant shoots confirmed that the euphorbia was able to absorb metals from the soil. Summarizing, at the end of the umbrella project, it was found that Euphorbia pitiusa proved to be a well-adapted and a well-performing metallophyte species. Euphorbia and the bacterial inoculum established a positive association. The bacteria inoculum significantly increased soil quality. Viromine had positive effect in combination with bacteria and mycorrhizae. In the soil, it increased pH, total and organic carbon, reduced the, the mobility of heavy metals and improved microbial activity. 
Uh, at the same time, it limited the plant growth and hence their efficacy in phytostabilization. In 2013, started the Italian project SMERI. Starting from the experience gained in the European project umbrella, the project wanted to transfer the acquired knowledge to a cluster of companies. Within the, the project, the status of the experimental field was analyzed after about two years, and the positive trend already triggered has been fostered, introducing the endemic plant Juncus maritimus, able to accumulate lead and cadmium in the root tips. Biogmentation was updated, adding to the previous consortium eight strains ex novo isolated and selected as plant growth promoters. So the experimental field was partly reorganized. The study of microbial community showed that the enhancement of plant growth promoting functions introduced by biogmentation with the native consortia triggered a positive and long lasting process in the soil. The effect remains in the long term only where the plants have been associated with the selected bacteria. Although the species composition changed, the introduced functions were maintained and the population was further specialized. Euphorbia better survived in the subplots treated with biogmentation, confirming that vegetation and bacteria are closely linked and interrelated. Bacteria create favorable conditions for plants on a substrate that has none of characteristic of the real soil. In parallel, plants in the rhizosphere favor the development, the evolution, and the differentiation of microbial community. At the end of the project, the vegetation showed the symptoms of stress, both in the presence and in the absence of biogmentation. The survival of, of plants was greatly reduced due to the adverse environmental conditions related to climate change. Extreme draw, Nine minutes. E extreme draw followed by water bombs had the disruptive effects in arid and poor in organic matter soils. Following the SMERI project, the experimental field was left in place, but without any kind of management and control, and without any kind of additional biogmentation treatment. Between 2015 and 18, sporadic inspections were made to follow its natural and spontaneous evolution. In 2016, the study of bacteria culturable fraction confirmed that the plant growth promoting functions were mainly concentrated in subplots treated with bacteria inocula. The effect persists almost about five years and bacteria play an important role on plant survival, reducing metal toxicity and increasing the efficiency of phytostabilization. Among functions, nitrogen fixation and siderophore production were prevalent. In the plots inoculated by bacteria, uh, the spectrum of metaboli metabolized carbonaceous substrates was broader. By augmentation enriched the metabolic capacity and, the and introduced the new metabolic functions, such as the digestion of sugar phosphates. In 2018, Further analysis confirmed that although the spontaneous renaturation process was in place as detectable by bacteria metabolic functions in the control, the subplots treated with biogmentation showed a better metabolic activity and a higher level of soil recovery and maturation as confirmed by the presence of spontaneous vegetation that here found more fav favorable conditions to take root and develop them in the control. So in conclusion, it can be said that selected endemic bacteria enhance functions in the soil and allow their maintenance over time. The inoculum directs and shapes community development. The positive effect of bioaugmentation on plant survival gradually decreases over five years without field management. So it should be necessary to 
define guidelines and protocols that include a repeated intervention over time in order to maintain high levels of microbial diversity and uh, activity. The combination of bioaugmentation with the, an uh, amendment, uh, such as Bioman, gave the best results in terms of soil metabolic activity, long-term plant survival, and the stabilization of effects over time. Irrational selection of the microbial inoculum that considers the ecological context can help to capture and exploit the intrinsic bioremediation potential of contaminated environments. Such processes take time and energy to uh, achieve equilibrium and uh, show real benefits. Anyway, they represent a sustainable, low impact and low cost solution. Uh, concluding, uh, the monitoring of bacteria, ecosystem and plant health is essential to follow and understand the evolution of the induced plant bacteria association but it's also necessary to integrate this analysis with the chemical, physical and geological data in order to obtain, to complete the picture and be able to evaluate the outcome of the remediation process applied. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Giada for, for this presentation. Uh, if uh, people have any questions, please can you uh, enter them in the chat and then we can uh, take them uh, at the end of the session. Okay, thank you again. Uh, so now we'll move to um, uh, Nicole Barger uh, from the University of Colorado in the USA. Uh, and she will outline uh, uh, some recent successes and challenges in the restoration of degraded dryland soils. So Nicole. Uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to make sure that we are properly set up here. So can you see my single screen now? It's on the... We see okay. two, but um, yeah, maybe... How about that? Okay, perfect. Great, thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, Today I'll be talking about recent successes and persistent challenges in restoration of degraded dryland soils. So what I'd like to do is just set the context first in terms of global land degradation and how it negatively impacts the well-being of 3.2 billion people globally. And in drylands, which is home to 38% of the global population, you know, I just want to stress the importance in this talk today of restoring degraded land is especially vital to human well-being in these systems. And when we look at the land base in many of these regions, that it is constrained by poor soil quality and loss of poor soil fertility. So we're really thinking in my lab group and more broadly, how, how do we start restoring some of these microbial communities? And we really heard some of that in the, in the previous talk. So the need for soil restoration is that soil surface disturbance may increase soil erosion, and alter um, nutrient and water so cycles and really be a destabilized, a lot, many of the human activities in these ecosystems may be a destabilizing factor in, in terms of soils and soil mo mobilization. And in the systems that I work in and in systems globally, an important component of soil recovery is contingent on the recovery of biological soil crust. And for the remaining part of the talk, I'll be talking about biocrust communities. So what are biocrusts? Biocrusts, uh, biological soil crusts or biocrusts are um, very common in dry land ecosystems. They uh, are estimated to cover uh, about 12% of global soil surfaces. And they are communities, diverse communities of microorganisms that are, consist of lichens, mosses, cyanobacteria, fungal communities, and other um, bacterial organisms that colonize this top veneer of um, soil, which is approximately two millimeters of the soil surface and are, are critically important for the functioning of drylands. So they can alter the hydrologic cycle in, in terms of retaining water. And um, they also are incredibly effective at soil stabilization. 
in addition to, and we also heard this in the previous talk, there are an array of nitrogen fixers in these soils that contribute to, um, to soil fertility, in addition to um, playing a, a pretty significant role in the photosynthetic capacity of these systems. So a, a, an area of soil in these, um, in these ecosystems can have the same, same or, or even higher photosynthetic rates than the surrounding vegetation. So the need for restoration of biological soil crusts is that they're often very slow to recovery due to resource constraints. And so there's a limited capacity for natural recovery. Some of the estimates for recovery of a biological soil crust can be decades to centuries. And so we just really identified that um, you know, after some of these soil surface disturbing activities such as oil and gas development, agricultural um, recreation in our region, there was a real need to develop um, effective strategies for biocrust restoration. And we really built on this emerging field of the use of microbial inoculants in soil restoration and re rehabilitation. Uh, and, and so we took a lot of our ideas of restoration from this field. So what I'll be presenting is some of our work in the Western United States, and, and in particular, I'll be, I'll be highlighting some of our work in the cold desert re region of the Great Basin of the Western US. So our approach to biocrust restoration was the staged approach, which we first had to develop, how, um, develop biocrust inoculum to add to degraded soils. But we also had the question that even if we developed inoculum, what are the best strategies for restoring the soils? Can we just develop inoculum and throw it out into a degraded soil? And we, we had an idea that we wouldn't be able to do that. And, and so we, in parallel, we developed biocrust inoculum, we developed restoration strategies that then fed into these multifactorial um, experiments that I, I'll describe. So first to briefly describe how we developed biocrust nurseries or inoculum, the idea is that we wanted to take a limited amount of field collected biocrust because we didn't want to collect, um, be, collect a lot of field collected biocrust for our experiments because we would just be disturbing soil to restore degraded soil. So one pathway we took is that we, we collected limited amounts in the field and then in, in trays in the greenhouse, we just uh, develop, enhance the biomass in the greenhouse. So going nearly tenfold over a three to four month period that then went into our field experiments. A second pathway, as you can see, um, going to the lower part of the screen here, is that with the mixed, we developed cultures from the field and and, and we specifically developed cultures of the cyanobacteria, which are some of the early successional um, my, microorganisms that, that are good at stabilizing the soils. So we also have a lab-grown culture. Then with our second, our, our approach to identifying the best biocrust restoration strategies, we did over a two-year period, a, a huge array of site preparation of adding water, adding nutrients to the soil, um, roughening the surface, and also trying to stabilize the surface. So from those huge number of experiments, what emerged as the best candidate restoration strategy was two stabilization strategies. So what we, we, we learned is that with, with a highly eroding soil, if you add inoc inoculum, that will just erode away if that soil surface is not stabilized. So one stabilization strategy we used was a straw checkerboard. So this is just when straw is inserted vertically into the soil as small silt fences to capture um, soil fines and also seeds. And this has been used extensively, as you can see in the lower picture in parts of China and dune, dune stabilization. A second soil stabilization strategy was the use of a, a commercial product. And we, this was a polyacrylamide, so you can almost think of this as a dirt glue. And that was actually the product name was dirt glue. And what that does is that the, we, it, it degrades over time, but initially it will um, stabilize that soil surface. So those were our two stabilization strategies that then fed into our broader experiment. 
So what you'll be seeing in the next couple graphs are an intact control. This is our target rest restoration of an intact biological soil crust. Then we had a disturbed degraded soil um, surface where we added no inoculum. In this experiment, we added field collected inocul inoculum because we had um, we wanted to know that if that local adapted inoculum would actually be effective relative to what we had grown up in the greenhouse, which is the local biomass, and what we had grown in the lab with the mixed isolates. Each one of those were inoculated onto a surface of the polyacrylamide or the straw. So some of our results, this is this first graph, and well, I'll be showing chlorophyll A, which over a three-year period after inoculation, and this is just an indicator of the photo photosynthetic capacity and a loose indicator of the cyanobacterial biomass. So again, we wanted to really track the cyanobacteria in these soils because those are the early colonizers um, that are really effective and, and stabilizing the soil surfaces. So what you'll see here is that we have the targets that have fairly high chlorophyll A rates. And then all of our experiments to the right, and if you can just take a look at this, you can say pretty easily, wow, it doesn't seem like that those inoculation and soil stabilization strategies were that effective. However, if we do focus in a little bit more and we change the scale on this graph, so again, we have a target of about 20 micrograms per gram soil of chlorophyll, that what we can see is the field collected so the, the inocula, inoculum that we directly took from that field site that was locally adapted shows some evidence that, that there has been more enhanced recovery relative to what we grew in the lab or grew in the greenhouse, which is the yellow bars or grew in the lab, which is the blue, blue bars. So coming off of this work, we were, you know, we are, faced with the question, what are the likely constraints to biocrust recovery under these field settings? So what we did find out is that we can grow it really well in the lab, and we can also grow it really well in the greenhouse. But once we go to a field setting, we're not having as a great success. And Nicole, so what, nine yes, minutes. five minutes? Nine, 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 nine minutes, nine. okay. So <laughs> I was like, oh, that's amazing. So what we do know is that when we shade the soil surface, it does promote, in addition to inoculating, it, we, we are able to reach our targets. So this just illustrates when you look at that far right intact column, and then you compare it to shading plus inoculating, after three years, we're able to, to really regrow a biocrust in the field. However, you can imagine, so finally, just wrapping up with some key messages, Barriers and challenges still exist in biocrust recovery with inoculation. And we do know that irrigation and shading likely alleviate resource constraints and UV stress, resulting in enhanced biocrust bio recovery. And we can do this over a short period of time. But our future challenge is scaling some of these approaches. So you can imagine we, we can't shade and water large expanses of land. So we're really working on scaling, thinking about how we scale some of these strategies. And I would like to acknowledge the incredible team and large team that contributed to this work. And our funding was supported by um, the University of Colorado and the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program in the US. And thank you. Arwen, you are mute. So thank you very much, Nicole, for that presentation. Very interesting. Uh, can I just remind again people to uh, put their questions in the chat? I can see that uh, a few of you are already doing this. Uh, so we'll move on. Uh, now the next presentation is um, Mr. Kumar. He's from the University of Agricultural Sciences in Bengaluru, uh, in India. And he's going to talk about the mass multiplication of native soil mesofauna for the reintroduction in the degraded agroecosystems. So, Mr. Kumar, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Huh. Hello. Huh. 
Hello, Hello. Mr. Oh, Kumar. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You just need to put in presentation mode. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Just a minute. The icon, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hello, I am Kumar from University of Agriculture Sciences, India. Yeah, yeah, you know that biological fertility of the soil is correlated to the interaction between soil, animals, uh, microorganisms, and plants, together with the abiotic factors of the soil environment to regulate the soil fertility. So you know that in nature, the detritus is uh, converted to humus in presence of soil biota, which have the different consumers levels, like uh, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, microphytic feeders, and the ultimate decomposer. If any human activity affect the any one consumer, so that is going to affect the humus formation in the nature. So here in the natural forest, the soil biota involved in the formation of the humus in naturally. And here we know that in the during the green revolution period, we introduced several agrochemicals, heavy machines and cultivation practices to get a higher yield. We got self-sufficiency in the food production. However, after some time, there was a stagnation of the lower crop yields due to loss of soil biological or mineralogical fertility and sustainability. To enhance the soil biological fertility, the scientists suggested to go for organic farming. But uh, there are some limitations because the less availability of the farmyard manure to all agro ecosystem and this well-decomposed farmyard manure will not support all soil invertebrates. And there may be slight increase in the existing fauna of the degraded land. So here, even in uh, uh, Muller in 1957 itself, so he noted the succession of animal right from fresh heaps of organic matter till the humus formation. Apart from this, Kissing and Rackton also highlighted the importance of indigenous invertebrate component in ecological restoration in agricultural landscape for better sustainable function. So then comes the question, why mass multiplication of misophana is required? You know that misophana along with the microflora, these are very, very fragile organisms they are, and also involved in a lot of uh, humus uh, formation activity, they are present in the pore space of the top layer of the soil. But uh, these are very susceptible for abiotic factors like uh, rainfall, water stagnation, soil erosion, prolonged drought, or reduced rainy days, or even termite foraging on dry plant residue also affect uh, the um, food of misophana in the dry land agriculture. So here, before initiation of uh, our experiment, we studied the factors involvement in the misophana development in the dry land agriculture, where the food is very much limited to the uh, soil misophana. The on trigger of, uh, onset of rainfall, the, the, it triggers the multiplication of misophana and reach the peak activity at the end of the rainy season. And then onwards, the decline in the misophanal population was observed. Even in the where the food is abundant in a natural grassland forest ecosystem and the Lucania leucocephala plantation. Here also the rainfall play a very important role where we observe only one single peak at the end of the rainy season. So here what we observe, the food is very much important for soil organism and uh, moisture in the soil and moisture in the food is also important for soil fauna multiplication. So based on this experience, we formulated 13 treatments with a major uh, uh, medium, media like a soil alone, natural one, fire peat alone, FIM alone, and combination of soil, fire peat, fire peat and FIM, and soil and FIM, and equal proportion of soil, fire peat and FIM. And these are the quantity of uh, media used uh, in different treatments per part. And these are the household vegetable waste to uh, naturally occur in uh, all uh, households, along with the tea and coffee waste and even small paper waste and bills were used as a food material for 
miss of an, uh, multiplication. So this is the experiment uh, view under the greenhouse condition. And this is the backyard in the open air system. And here the methodology, the pot size was 30 centimeter width at the top and 20 centimeter width at the bottom and 30 centimeter height of the pot. The misophiona rich soil was collected from the natural grassland, forest plantation, and you'll look in here, you go cephala plantation and mixed well, about 400 grams of mixed soil per pot was placed on the surface of the medium in the pot and 250 grams of household vegetable waste were placed over the soil surface of the pots at a weekly interval. And these pots were watered daily, uh, approximately one liter per pot. And uh, 200 grams of uh, soil samples were drawn per pot uh, at a monthly interval up to one year and uh, two once in two months after one year for the extraction of mesophana. These are, these are the mesophana extracted during the experimentation period. So regarding the results, so here we got uh, uh, at the end of the at the end of the eighteen months. So the mean population was a high, significantly high in the farmyard manure uh, treatment, and which was followed by equal proportion of soil, kyle peat, and uh, FOM, and which was on par with uh, the kyle peat alone. So here the soil media recorded significantly less. Uh, uh, of a population compared to other media. However, all media recorded significantly higher misophonal abundance compared to natural ecosystem. So even <clears throat> the best media, FIM alone, and the least one soil, fauna, soil uh, alone. So here also we can see the activity of uh, misophana throughout the experimentation period with varied population. So regarding <clears throat> the diversity, so here, the treatment number 11, 50 is to 50 soil and FOM recorded a significantly higher Simpson diversity index, which was on par with uh, uh, Kyer Peak and FOM, 75 is to 25 proportion. And these were almost uh, uh, on par with the natural ecosystem. The rest of the media recorded 0.18 to 0.27 Simpson diversity indices. So the abundance of misophana in the backyard. So here you can see the gradual increase in population of misophana in the backyard and recorded higher population at the end of the 18 months after interval and uh, which was very close to natural ecosystem. And even in the backyard also, the misophonal multiplication uh, uh, activity was uh, seen throughout the experimentation period uh, uh, varied from 56 to 148 uh, uh, animals per 400 grams of soil. So even diversity of uh, uh, soil animal was maximum at 18 months after interval, which was very close to natural ecosystem. So the, regarding the composition, in the natural uh, activity where at, uh, only single peak activity was observed in the nature. So here cryptostigmata dominated over other uh, acari and uh, oniquiridae dominated over other columbolans and so seed was there. And then in the best media, FOM, so here other acari dominated over other things and uh, spoduridae dominated over other columbolans. In the soil, the least preferred one, so where the cryptostigmata and mesostigmata were in equal proportion and uh, oniquiridae uh, dominated over other columbolans along with, uh, uh, here we also observed pseudoscorpion, isopods and uh, uh, isopod rest uh, were macrofunnel images. In the backyard, so again, cryptostigmata dominated and then oniquiridae dominated over other columbola. So here we have also observed symphyla, isopods, and sources, and the rest for macrofauna images. So here, the conclusion, all media harbored higher mesofauna abundance throughout the year compared to mesofauna of natural ecosystem at the end of uh, uh, rainy season only. Kyre peat is suitable for urban dwelling and the soil mesopana diversity can be maintained in an institute of different region to protect the indigenous soil mesopana for future use. The farmers can use the backyard or farmyard manure heaps to multiply soil mesopana, na native soil mesopana, and mesopana rich kyre peat or FOM or combination of these two can be easily applied in the degraded land. So the diversity of mesopana and microflora can be replenished, introducing a small quantity of topsoil 
and lifter of the undisturbed ecosystem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Kumar, for that very interesting presentation and, in, and for keeping exactly to time. So very much appreciated to that. So again, people, if you have uh, any questions uh, or comments, uh, please um, uh, revert uh, to the chat. Okay, okay the, the final presentation then for this <coughs> part of the, of the session uh, is um, uh, Claudia Roas from the Institute of Agri-Food, Animal and Environmental Sciences from the University of O'Higgins in Chile. That's not, it doesn't look like Mr. Claudia. Hello. Here we go. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay. Yes, perfect. Yeah, yeah there's a bit All of a right, lag. Thank there's you. there's thank a lag in, so the, in the changing of the screen. So yeah, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, to the organizers for putting this symposia together in spite of the pandemic. And thanks uh, to all the audience for allowing me today to share with you uh, the experience that we have in our lab. Today, I'm gonna be uh, talking to you about the experience that we have uh, when we use organic amendments, different organic amendment, amendments in soil that have been affected by fires especially in a in Mediterranean forest, which is typical of central Chile. So here I wanted to first uh, start by um, acknowledging the importance of fires in um, shaping the structure of uh, forest ecosystems. We do know that they are important uh, to shape the structure and uh, to help to, to the resilience of those ecosystems. The problem is when it uh, happens, when uh, the fires increase in number, in frequency, uh, intensity, and of course, the amount of, uh, of area that is affected. And that is what I wanted to share with you with this graph. If you take a look here, what I'm showing you in these red bars are, uh, is the area affected by fires since the late uh, 70s in Chile. And here in these lines, you can see the numbers of uh, fires occurring from the late 70s as well. So I want you to pay attention to uh, the last uh, decade, starting from about uh, 2000, uh, 2010. And we do see that the number of fires are slightly increasing in Chile. And that coincides with a, a decade of severe mega droughts that we are experiencing in Chile. And now when you take a look at the red bars, we do see that on average, since the late 70s, we have had about 50,000 hectares affected by fires. But that was not the case of 2017, when we, do, we did have about almost 600,000 hectares affected by fire. So that is uh, uh, that uh, event in 2017, what was what it led us to conduct the research that um, I'm gonna be sharing with you today. So this mega uh, fire, as we, uh, as we uh, named that, uh, occur in, this in particularly in central Chile, uh, which is a uh, area uh, with a Mediterranean climate. And this biome is one of the five biomes on earth. Uh, in this type uh, is, is really important in terms of um, biodiversity and the endemism that we do see in this area. So uh, the, the research that we conducted was in one of the three main uh, administrative regions that was affected by the fires occurring in January of 2017. And January is uh, coincides with the uh, summer here in Chile in the Southern Hemisphere. So what we, what we did was to, uh, in 2018, uh, in June, we uh, went to a field which was affected by fires. And as you can see, 
uh, the the vegetation still affected uh, is, is changing the the ways growing is not it's, they used to be uh, trees and now they are growing as a shrub and we do see a ecosystem that was not affected by fire so we use this is this is in total about an hectare in size and we did uh, perform our experiment here so what we did was to try different organic amendments. Um, uh, yeah, we, we did try different organic amendments and uh, we set up those in small plots, small experimental plots in the affected area. And we did compare those organic amendments with uh, the uh, soils that were under this unaffected uh, ecosystem. So the organic amendments that we did use were uh, particularly uh, animal manures that were uh, available uh, for the community. And I, I, here I wanna emphasize the importance uh, to work with the community and to propose uh, uh, restoration strategies that are effective and can be uh, used by the community which was affected by in this case by by this uh, land burning so we we decided to use manure that they have available at the at the their fields and we also use compost this was um uh this was a commercial compost that uh had uh, come uh, uh, especially from um from residues from agriculture so uh, we in, in these three uh, type of amendments, we did use the same uh, rate in terms of volume, 200 uh, cubic meter per hectare. And of course, by the bulk density and uh, moisture content of each of these uh, materials, the final weight, dry weight that we put in the field is different. Um, but uh, I wanna also emphasize that all the treatments that we use had that covered in mulch because that uh, helped us to kind of keep moisture uh, and protect uh, the uh, seeds and plants that we also established here. In addition, we did have a, a treatment with just mulch, nothing more than mulch. And of course the control uh, uh, plots which were burned and, and we did not add anything there. And of course the ecosystem of reference that I mentioned before. So for this experiment, what I'm gonna be showing you today here, we sampled in January of 2019. So that means two years after the occurrence of fires and after eight months after the application of uh, the organic amendments that we tried. So what we can see first is that uh, I wanna point out that uh, we did use basal respiration uh, using the methods of a substrate induced respiration with glucose. And what we did, what we observed here is that after two years, uh, remember we, we the fire occurred in 2017 and we sampled in 2019. And after two years, we still see a fire disturbance in uh, soil respiration. So the soils that were affected by fire still respire significantly more than uh, the um, ecosystem of preference. Now, when we take a look at uh, other soil condition that is, is really important for us uh, in terms of biological conditions, we do see that it, I want you to pay attention to these two treatments. And we do see that after two years of fire occurrence, we still see effect of fires in terms of organic uh, carbon content. We have less organic carbon in uh, after two years of fires occurrence in the soils, soils that were affected. And also we still see lower uh, amount of uh, nitrogen, total nitrogen in soils that were uh, affected by, by land, land burning. Now, when we take a look at the treatments, uh, we do see that as we, the, uh, the um, soils that receive fresh, but organic amendments, that means manure, especially swine manure, and then followed by poultry manure, are the soils that are still respiring more. They are liberating more CO2 than, for example, compost, 
which is a material more stabilized, the organic matter there is more stabilized. And we do see also that the, the, the treatment with just mulch, nothing more than mulch, also has more uh, basal respiration than the control. So from this graph, we can see that soil after two years still uh, show the effect of fires. And when, when we add organic matter, uh, fresh materials uh, result in more soil respiration. So now when we take a look at the microbial biomass, uh, we don't see that clear pattern that we do see here with uh, the addition of, of organic amendment or uh, just the control uh, with uh, uh, affected, fire affected soil. We do see that almost all the treatment are similar in terms of microbial biomass. But again, the two treatments that are uh, resulting in more microbial biomass in the soils are the ones that are uh, were treated with, um, with uh, fresh organic amendment, especially again, swine manure. And another point that I wanted to highlight here is that it, when we try to restore soil, especially biological related conditions, it, using organic amendments, we do need to be aware of the immediate and long-term um, responses of the soils to these different amendments. Why, why I'm saying that is because we do see that fresh materials increase, immediately increase, when I say immediately, it's eight months, uh, increase basal respiration and microbial biomass. But in the long-term, the carbon that is getting into the soil is less in fresh materials when I compare that with a more stabilized material as is compost. So we do need to take into account what are the goals, the overall goals of the restoration approach that we are, um, uh, we are using. So in this case, the use of compost is uh, allowing us to, to uh, predict that the restoration effort will last longer in the soil as, as more organic carbon uh, uh, is getting into the soil. And this uh, result one, is one eight, minute. eight one months. Minute. And we do see, uh, we are seeing the same result um, 20, 20 months later too. So this is a really good notice. So here in just in terms of carbon mineralization and uh, metabolic quotients, we do see, again, the same thing. Uh, the fresh organic material are activating more the soil than the compost material. So this is something that we need to take into account. And just to, this is uh, the last for the results. And we do see that the uh, organic amendment soils separate apart from those that did not receive amendment. This is the burn soil and this is the control. And all the parameters that we uh, uh, measured were affected, especially by treatment. And uh, all the biological conditions were affected by treatment. And among the uh, physical condition, chemical condition we measured, electrical conductivity was the one that most affected biological condition, in spite of the low level that we do see. And uh, out of the treatment, all affected uh, the biological condition. And interestingly enough, we, uh, we confirm with statistic statistical analysis that the burn soil is still affecting biological condition. So with that, uh, it is important to highlight that uh, is, is the type of organic matter uh, matters because the response is different in soil. And uh, from the organic amendments that we use, uh, fresh material imply a, a immediate response in microbial uh, activity, but carbon uh, sources, more stabilized carbon sources like, like compost might uh, reflect, reflect longer a positive effect in restoration of these soils. So that's why it's important. It's important to understand which is the organic matter that I'm adding. And for the future work, we are combining these uh, ecological functions. And we do want to understand how, how the community structure of this ecosystem are shaped by the organic amendments and the fire occurrence. So with that, I would like to say uh, thanks to the group in Spain, uh, which is part of this uh, work, and my group here in Chile. 
the fund funding funding agency. And with that, I will uh, leave it here and thank uh, you all for uh, their uh, um, attendance. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia, for that presentation. Uh, and again, please, uh, if you have any questions or comments to, to put them in the chat and maybe we don't have so much time, but at least we can now try to have a, um, a number of uh, points raised for, for discussion. Uh, and so for um, uh, Giada and Nicole, maybe there's a common question on the uh, possibility to scale up uh, your treatments uh, or your experiments. Would you like to comment on that? Maybe Jada first and then Nicole. Uh, for me, uh, actually the scale up is not so difficult to, uh, to do. And there are more and more cases in which uh, by augmentation and uh, especially phytoremediation um, uh, applied uh, together with the by augmentation has been successful successfully applied. Uh, the critical points uh, uh, are two, the time of recovery, and the second, the choice of plants and microorganisms. So uh, it's important to uh, choose uh, um, plants and microorganisms well integrated in the environment and that uh, um, not have any negative impact. So uh, it's important to do a good characterization in the site and uh, not only at uh, the site, but even in the landscape context in order to make a right ch choice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicole? Yeah, thank you. I, it, as I said, it's, it is a real challenge to think about doing microbial inoculation at, at the scale of you know, what would be needed in some of these degraded lands. But I, I think one, one answer is to think about the development of inoculum. So we already have with bio, biofuels and cyanobacteria, we have facilities in several countries that we are able to scale up and be able to grow these cyanobacterial populations. So that's the good news. The, the challenge still is, is that once it goes to the field, um, making that inoculum successful. So we had some really great uh, uh, suggestions here in the chat of how do you mix with other materials such as biochar or um, something that will alter that, that the um, conditions at the surface when inoculating. And so I think that that still is a real challenge and I don't have a great answer, but for that at this point, but it, it is something that we are thinking about is that that scaling at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here for uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, what would you say is the most important role of soil mesofauna on soil health and functioning? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, here, you know that I show that uh, the, the interlink uh, of uh, different uh, soil uh, animals in nature for the formation of humus. So here, they, uh, their feeding behavior are different, primary, secondary, tertiary consumer. Primary is the decomposer, and secondary and tertiary are the predators. And here we have mycophytic feeders, which regulate the soil microbes, so which uh, the disease outbreak will be maintained. And apart from that, the dead bodies of these mesofauna and fecal material acts as a medium for soil microflora. So where whatever we introduce the microbes uh, into the soil, so their natural survival on these dead body and fecal material will be there. Apart from that, the, the fecal material also helps in stable soil aggregate formation, which helps in soil structure formation, uh, which is very important for uh, natural condition of the uh, soil. Apart from that, uh, here the, it helps in nutrient retention and sustainability in the nature. So these uh, so soil mesofauna are working at the ground level, at soil level, when compared to the macrofauna, they come and go where they have higher mobility. But these are a very fragile organism along with the mesofauna they play. Very, very, very important. Uh, that's why we have to uh, multiply and introduce especially the native one, which are related to the native region so that we have to multiply that one. 
to get a sustainability unless this one so we don't get uh, much things thank you okay. uh, thank you very much uh, and maybe a, a final question for uh, for claudia uh, is it practical to use manure uh, or other amendments for soil restoration at a larger scale so for example mm -hmm. For more than a hundred hectares. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question because uh, it's allowed me to highlight uh, something which is very important. In a large scale, if you're thinking to cover all the area or the land, of course, is not uh, approachable from the economic point of view. But we, what we are proposing is to use small slots many small slots rather than covering all the surface because we have seen a uh, edge positive effect that uh, when you amend the soil not only you get positive effect in the soil that you uh, use amendment but also at the edges so you have like an island of fertility that is expanding so that is an interesting question because i have had it many times and when you think in the large scale covering everything is not economically feasible but when you try small spots uh, that can be a more reasonable approach okay uh, so um, unfortunately i think we've uh, run out of time for the first uh, first hour uh, i would still encourage you to uh, keep um, chatting um, uh, and exchanging via the by the chat I see that there is a proposal for people to join a, uh, an internet cafe for people to network and continue discussions after the session. Um, so uh, I think that was a really interesting uh, session on or the group of pap papers on uh, showing the, the value of soil biodiversity in, in land restoration uh, in a range of, uh, of different uh, uh, climate conditions and, uh, and issues. So thank you very much for your willingness and uh, to participate and the effort you've made to uh, present your findings clearly uh, and, and, and uh, uh, interestingly as well. So um, now we'll move on to the to the second part of the of the session. Uh, normally we would have said welcome back, but I think you all stay here anyway, so nobody goes. Um, so we have four more presentations. Uh, again, I'd like to just remind uh, people to, uh, to keep to the allotted 10 minutes. I will remind you uh, when you have a one minute to go. Um, the colleagues in FAO have said actually that uh, there is no um, formal uh, deadline to the, to the end of the session. So if people are interested and in discussion is still ongoing, we can maybe bring back uh, some of the questions from the first session as well for discussion uh, at the end of the uh, end of this one hour, so we'll we'll see uh, how we how we get on. So then the first presentation this afternoon of of, of the second session rather uh, is given by uh, Sara Pelaz from the University of uh, Limerick in Ireland, and she's also going to talk about uh, soil macrofauna and mesofauna diversity in rehabilitated mine tailings. So Sarah, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Arwin. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. yes. So uh, thanks to the organizers as well. And good afternoon, morning and evening to everyone. I'm Sarah Pelaez. I'm a PhD student on soil biodiversity and ecosystem restoration from the University of Limerick. And today I'm going to guide you through some of the results from my sampling campaign of last year. My PhD focuses on understanding uh, ecosystem development in, uh, with a special emphasis on soil macrofauna and mesofauna diversity in rehabilitated mine tailings. As you all might know, mining is a necessary good, but very controversial activity. Most of the commodities we enjoy on our daily life highly depends on metal mining. Let me just give you an example. Do you really know where the materials of your mobile come from? I can tell you that more than one half of all the components are common for minerals and metals, 
coming from a mine. However, metal mining is one of the most uh, ecologically damaging activities worldwide. So that is why industry needs to come up with sustainable, long-term and effective rehabilitation strategies. Traditionally, a rehabilitation assessment had focused on monitoring above ground vegetation and soils with less attention to soil fauna diversity. But we, now we know that soil fauna are critical for rehabilitation strategies to become sustainable. And that is why uh, in our study, we did a general evaluation of soil invertebrates diversity, focusing on three of the most important ecosystem engineers airworms, spread tails, and ants. We wanted to answer the following research question. Are soil invertebrates diversity and abundance a good indicator of rehabilitation success? To answer this, we identify key soil fauna group in a chrono sequence of five, 15, and 30 years of rehabilitated mine tailings. With this data, we calculate uh, several diversity indexes to evaluate the rehabilitation success. Let me just introduce you the study site. The, the study sites are rehabilitated metalliferous tailings located at an industrially sensitive site. So these all three uh, locations are made uh, of tailings from lead and zinc extraction. It is important to notice that um, the substrate is a techno soil whose physicochemical properties and pedogenesis are not compared to that of uh, actual soils. You can see the structure of these techno soils in the diagram below. During the sampling of above ground invertebrates, we did debug sampling with a debug, which is a vacuum cleaner device. Um, we also installed 10 pitfalls per location and to sampling the air ones, we did hand sorting. Um, all the samples were uh, identified up to morpho species with species level when possible. Let me show you some of the results. Here we compare the results from the diversity indexes in these three locations. We can see that there is not a um, huge homogeneity in the results on the indexes. For example, Simpson points to where a decrease in diversity from years of rehabilitation, richness just toward the opposite trend, and Sanon and Evenings look, uh, uh, the results here looks to be more aligned. Traditionally, Sanon uh, has been the most used in diversity assessment because it accounts for entropy rather than a species number. So this might represent reality better. So according to these results from Sanon, we have that biodiversity, uh, invertebrates biodiversity is at its highest at the beginning, then decreases and goes up again. But what is going on with ecosystem engineers in these three sites? We have at the beginning in the early sites that Colombola communities are characterized by opportunistic species. Ants were absent and airworms are species uh, that are disturbant tolerant. However, in the older sites, we have more complex Colombola communities. Ants appear in higher number and we have uh, airworms um, characterized from well-developed soils. Just to wrap up the results, I can tell you that with years from rehabilitation, the diversity is at its highest at the beginning, then decreases and goes up again. But the data on ecosystem engineers shows that uh, there is a more abundance and complex community in older sites. So how do we explain these results? Let me show you two pictures from the field. On the left, you have location A, and on the right, you have location B. And if we only look at the information from diversity indexes to evaluate rehabilitation, we could misinterpret these results, saying that rehabilitation at location A was, max, uh, was more success 
because it's presented a higher diversity than in location B. And we know that this is not what is actually happening here because data on abundance and diversity of ecosystem engineers points toward the opposite. The results from biodiversity indexes are better explained and respond better to the classical model of succession in which when a new habitat became available, many species can potentially colonize it and in diversity rises. So if we come back to the question at the beginning of the slide, are soil invertebrates diversity and abundance a good indicator? The data from our sites points toward the direction that uh, these indexes alone are not a good indicator of rehabilitation success in these sites. We also like to highlight that this kind of large general invertebrates uh, diversity studies are not transferred to industry since they require a large number of taxonomy specialists and sampling effort. We would like to point uh, our research for the future and our next steps will be that rehabilitation assessment will focus more on grouping soil fauna into functional rather than taxonomic because it's more ecologically meaningful. And we will like to evaluate the soil food web in this chrono sequence. Uh, we would like to look at the species specific feeding with uh, isotope analysis. And uh, we also think that more research is needed on the role of ecosystem engineers as good long-term indicators of rehabilitation success. So thanks very much for your attention and my contact details are in this last slide. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for both an interesting presentation uh, and also for keeping so uh, succinctly to time. So thank you very much. And so people, if you have uh, any questions or comments, uh, please post uh, in the chat and we'll come back to Sarah uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so moving on, then the, the next presentation is by Mr. Raul Ortega from the University of uh, Almeria in Spain. And he will present uh, his work on the recovery of microbial status with organic amendments on soils affected by mining activity on a decadal temporal scale. So, Raul. Thank you, Edwin. Good afternoon to everyone. Let me share my, my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, it's clear. Okay, thank you. As you say, the, the title of this work is Recovery of Microbiological Status with Organic Amendments on Soils Affected by Mining Activity in a Decadal Temporal Scale. <clears throat> this research is hosted by the Soil Microbiological Lab of the University of Almeria in Spain of which Dr. Isabel Miralles and I are the leaders. Our study area is located in, <clears throat> sorry, in the southeast of Spain, in the province of Almeria. And we have worked in a limestone extraction quarry where the ecosystem is totally degraded by mining activities. The climatic conditions are extreme, only 230 millimeters of annual precipitation high solar variation and completely degraded soils without organic matter structure and uh, very fragile, where erosion processes and the, and the certification can occur, as we can see in the picture. <clears throat> the use of organic amendments in soil restoration is of great interest because it has been shown that they improve physical, chemical and biological soil properties. Besides, the soil bacteria communities are favored by, this, by these inputs of organic matter, together with the addition of other taxa included in the amendments. 
of these bacteria can contribute to the plant establishment and favor the mineralization and unification of organic matter, matter through the improvement of biochemical cycles. On this query, we had established two experimental parcels, one in 2008, here, in the left, uh, the left picture, and another one in 2018, right, uh, with two different research projects here in the right. Now we I'm going to focus on the data from the uh, long-term experiment. In both experimental parser, we are studying the evolution of the microbiological communities after the addition of organic amendments. On the work show here, we have studied if the addition of compost derived from urban waste permitted the development of soil chemical properties and bacterial communities similar to those of the natural soils of the surroundings of in a temporal scale of a decade. So we have we established several plots of 15 meter long and five meter width, which accounts for a total surface of 75 square meters. Three replicates of these parcels were used for each of the following conditions. One, soils with organic amendment, two, soils without amendment or controlled soils, and three, non-degrade natural soils. The input of organic amendment in the soils were applied was estimated to increase at two percent of total organic carbon in the first twenty uh, centimeter of the soil. We also restored soil with three different plant species adapted to the Mediterranean semi-arid conditions of the area: Stipatenacissima, Antilithisoides, and Antilithermiflora. Ten years later. We sampled soils up to a depth of 10 centimeters. And we studied some chemical properties and bacterial communities. And we analyzed differences among treatment for these variables and relationships between chemical properties and bacterial taxonomy. The, the chemical properties analyzed in this work were total organic carbon. Um, pH and total nitrogen, and the uh, bacterial tasa were determined by metagenomic analysis. Uh, we extracted the DNA of the bacteria using a KIGN commercial kit, and the amplicons were later sequenced using the uh, Illumina uh, sequencing platform. Bioinformatic uh, analysis were carried on with the software Chine 2 and statistical analysis include permanova, general linear models, and Pearson correlation coefficients. About our results, we found 162 soil bacteria taxa up to a level of genus with an abundance uh, higher than 0.1% in all the samples. General linear models show it that compost from urban waste significantly influence the 59% of all bacteria taxa. Meanwhile, natural soils only influence the 14%. We found some common bacterial taxa in amended and natural soils, but not in controlled soils. And here we have some example of this taxa, where we can see that they uh, both appear in amended soils and natural soils, but not, but not in mm, controlled soils without inputs of organic matter. About the chemical parameters, we can say that all pH uh, of the soil were basic because of the uh, carbonate contents of the barren material, the limestone quarry, but non amended soils, control, control soils, show with higher values and statistically were different to the soil with compost and natural soils where the decrease in pH level can be explained by the higher and similar values of total organic matter, higher than 3%. Meanwhile, in controlled soils, uh, the values were near to zero, despite of the mining activity this uh, 10 years ago. So with compost, show it 
the highest nitrogen contents compared with other treatments, and again, control soil, non-amended, showing nearly, nearly uh, nothing nitrogen content. On this table, we show bacterial taxa that on one hand, they were common in natural and amended soils, but they were not present in controlled soils. I mean, soils without uh, input of organic matter. And on another hand, they show with statistical significance with chemical properties. We can see that all these taxa are positively correlated with total organic carbon and total nitrogen, which clearly shows um, <clears throat> the establishment of bacterial taxa in composted soils with similar behavior to other more mature soils, in this case, natural soils. Uh, from our results, we can say that compost treatment in totally degraded soils promoted in a decadal scale chemi chemical properties similar or even better to the natural soils. Luna et al. show it in this uh, same soils that the improvement of the chemical properties was already significant after five years of restoration. We have confirmed and that after 10 years, this effect is maintained. About the microbial populations, other authors note the addition of organic amendments in restored soils increase and improve the soil microbial communities and the origin of the compost influence the, comp the composition of the communities. We also confirm that compost have an important influence on the bacterial taxa, 59% uh, of them. Common taxa between natural soils and amended soils show a similar behavior with chemical parameters, as described before. Positive correlation with total organic carbon and nitrogen content, and negative correlation with pH. Some bacterial taxa that we found, like pedomicrobium, was already observed in soils rich in organic matter, and Therimonas was found in developed soils near our study area corroborating that compost treat soils permit the establishment of taxa present in more mature soils. As the final conclusions, we can say that our results suggest that soil restored with urban waste compost has established chemical properties and microbial, and microbial communities similar to the surrounding natural soils in a decadal scale. However, the degraded soils without organic amendments used as control did not improve their chemical and biological properties. This data and other uh, have been published in one in this paper. I think I, I, I can later copy and paste it in the chat in the chat in case in case someone is interested. And then I have one more minute. I'd like to say that at the present we are working on plots and on the plots I show at the beginning, installed in 2018 the same limestone quarry, and we are studying the effect of several organic amendments in physical, biochemical, and biological property. Biological properties were microbial community and CO2 fluxes. These, there are three, uh, and now we are using three inputs of organic matter, um, vegetable compost from garden waste, vegetable compost from horticulture, greenhouse, crop residues, and established sea waste sludge. Here are some pictures of the works, uh, here, so here, a picture of the evolution of the soil restoration from to 2019 uh, to, uh, to nowadays. And with that, I finish. I, I hope I'm on time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Raul, for that, for a very striking demonstration of the power of uh, soil biodiversity and also very strong links to the circular economy and the, uh, and, and the bioeconomy sector and the, and the reuse there of, of sewage sludge, which is actually quite a topical issue. So indeed, yes, thank you for keeping the time. Um, as with the previous speakers, please uh, put your questions to Raul uh, in the chat and we'll come back to those uh, in uh, 20 minutes or so. So thank you again. So moving on, the, the next presentation then is by Mr. Daniel Castro from the Instituto Amazonica de Investigaciones Científicas 
from the National University of Colombia. Uh, and he will outline how much so their biodiversity is restored after a cattle ranching pasture is abandoned. Uh, so, Daniel, the, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, it's very clear. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning from Colombia. My name is Daniel Castro, a researcher uh, of, of, at Institute in Amazon Institute Sinchi uh, from Colombia. I will present this study titled How Much uh, Soil uh, uh, Diversity is Restored After a Cattle Ratching Pasture is Abandoned for its Natural Regeneration in the Amazon Region of Colombia. Uh, soils by diversity biological communities are considered healthy soils. In tropical soils, there are two groups of great importance. The first group is the soil macrofauna that contribute to the organic matter cycling uh, and the efficient return to the nutrient of, of uh, to plants. And the second group is the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that contribute significantly in the efficient phosphorus acquisition of the plants to uh, mycorrhizal associations. The forestation of natural forests to transform in pastures uh, is commonly in the Great Amazonia and also in the Colombian Amazon region. But this poorly now is biological community restore themselves after, uh, natural after pastures abandoned for their natural regeneration. Meanwhile, uh, soil macrofauna and arbuscular fungal communities are high sensitive to the chan light use. Talking about of the potential that soil macrofauna has an indicator of soil quality and the permanently present of the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, uh, fungi association to the plant communities, we evaluate how soil macrofauna and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi diversity is affected by deforestation and how much of it is restored through a natural uh, regeneration process. Um, this study was conducted in the Caqueta State in the northwestern of Colombian Amazon region. We evaluate five different restoration, uh, different restoration stage. Uh, we evaluate pastures that had recently livestock activity. Uh, we also evaluate young secondary vegetation, uh, vegetation uh, from natural regeneration between zero, zero to 10 years. Uh, also, secondary veg uh, vegetation between 10 to 20 years. Uh, also, secondary old forest between 20 to 40 years. And finally, mature forest more than uh, four, uh, 40 years old. Six plots uh, of each regeneration age were sampled uh, for a total uh, of 30 plots. Uh, the soil macrofauna sampling was done following the methodology of Tropical Soil Biology and Fertility Program, TSBA. On each restoration edge, a plot of 60 per 60 meters was limited. Uh, there are five uh, TSBA monolites of uh, 25 per 25 centimeters watt made. In each monolite, uh, samples were collected of four different dims. Uh, but, but this story, unfortunately, uh, uh, was impossible, the Edgewood collections. Um, um, uh, another hand uh, for arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal sampling, a topsoil uh, sample of approximately of uh, 100 grams was collected at the, same, at the site of, the, of the each uh, TSBI monolite. Uh, for classification of uh, soil macrofauna, morphological identification has, uh, has been carried out. Um, for mycorrhizal fungi, we uh, identify a specific otus using uh, illumina sequencing methods and specific primers. Another test was performed for soil macrofauna diversity and species richness, and cruise quality test was used for um, uh, mycorrhizal fungi abundance spores and species richness. Diversity analysis was done through a rarefaction and extrapolation curves. Uh, for our results in soil macrofauna community, uh, we identified 28 taxonomic groups. Uh, the, the most abundant groups uh, were ants, termites, and larvae, uh, especially larvae for Coleoptera and Lepidoptera. Uh, all the speci uh, specimens uh, we identified at least two, two family. And we found 791 morphotypes in 124 families. 
uh, in 30, uh, 37 orders in nine class and two films. Thermites and ants were the most dense groups. Uh, Thermites was the highest uh, high diversity uh, values in soil in restoration age, but uh, less representation was shown in pastures. Ants was more abundant and through the macrofauna abundance didn't change of the years. The density, uh, the, the density uh, showed a big difference uh, in, 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 uh, between termites and ants, being the two, uh, the two most uh, dominant groups uh, in density. But in abundance, other groups had importance such as Coleoptera, Clopoda, Diplopoda, and spiders. Uh, soil macrofauna species richness increased uh, with the age of restoration regeneration present a significant difference in successional forests older than uh, 10 years old uh, with uh, the free successional age. Uh, macrofauna density and species richness were not correlation in the natural regeneration consequence, uh, where in all re regeneration stage, we present high values uh, of species richness, significantly uh, different for pastures. Pioneer species are abundant in the second stage of regeneration and therefore high values of species richness are present. But over the time, these species are less abundant or disappear um, and other species big to appear uh, that not adapt well to degraded soils. For example, uh, in, your, uh, in young stage, we found many occurrence, uh, occurrence of ethnic species as Gosmania europuntata, uh, Paratractina longicornis, and Solenopsis derminata, that species are considered as urban pests in Colombia. And for termites, uh, we found Rusitermes uh, boteroi, Anopotermes merianus, and Heterotermes kinis. And these species uh, adapt better to low fertility soils. And these species disappear or are rare species in mature forests. As was expected, the lowest diversity uh, occur in pastures. After 40 years of natural generation, soil macrofauna diversity is not restored completely. However, some authors indicate that soil macrofauna communities could be restored in a short time when activity process at performance are agroforestry system, forest plantation, and other crop systems. Uh, for arboriscal mycorrhizal fungi, we obtained uh, 44 virtual taxa. Glo uh, Globus genus was the most abundant uh, genus, uh, followed by the alcoholospora genus. Uh, mycorrhizal fungal communities were different at the five forest stage of the current sequence, and the diversity of mycorrhizal fungi is projected uh, to be much greater than that obtained. Uh, in the soil, uh, the abundance of spores and the virtual taxa richness of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi was higher in young regeneration state than in mature forest. In mature forest, mycorrhizal uh, is mainly in rods and not in the soil metrics. We also found uh, that some virtual taxa were present in all chronosequence, uh, while other virtual tanks, as you can see in green in the table, only appear in the late stage of the regeneration. Uh, finally, uh, we conclude that degraded pastures that are abandoned for the natural generation could restore their soil biological communities. A uh, natural truth, the time. A uh, restoration of soil biological communities take more than uh, 20 years to reach a similar species richness than non disturbed Amazon forest, uh, but species composition will be not uh, will not be the same. A uh, change in the soil and the muscular uh, mycorrhizal fungal composition and the biomass could have consequences that have don't be estimated yet. Uh, we are thank you for uh, to our funding institute and thank you for your attention. So thank you very much for that presentation and, and again also for 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 keeping to time. Uh, and please, uh, people, uh, if anybody has any uh, questions, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll come back to them uh, in about uh, ten minutes uh, or, or so.
Okay, so the final uh, presentation for this session is from Mr. Warshi Dan Den Inia. I apologize for the pronunciation if it's uh, incorrect. Uh, from the Faculty of Agriculture from the University of Peradenia in Sri Lanka. And Warshi will give a presentation on the effect of shifting cultivations on bacterial communities in the forests of Sri Lanka. Uh, Warshi, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity given to present in this forum. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm going to present uh, our work on uh, bacterial community diversity as affected by the shifting cultivation uh, on Purulu International Biosphere Reserve, which we did using a metagenomic uh, approach. Forested ecosystems in Sri Lanka are constantly under pressure. Uh, in 1920, we had about 50% uh, of our land area in this country under forest. However, it has reduced to 26% by now. And from this uh, land cover, if you look at the dry forested ecosystems, it uh, covers 22% of the land area in the country. Uh, however, we have very less information about the soil biodiversity in our forested ecosystems, especially in the dry forested ecosystems. In this study, we targeted the Hurulu International Biosphere Reserve, which is located in the uh, northeastern part of the country and uh, also in relatively dry environment. And uh, this forest is under high pressure of socioeconomic stressors and experiencing a range of forest disturbances. So uh, there are studies that indicate that forest disturbances affect soil microbial diversity in evergreen forests. And also it is important to understand the factors governing soil biodiversity in these forested ecosystems when we are formulating conservation measures. Therefore, uh, the objective of our study was to assess the effect of forest disturbances mainly because of the shifting cultivation practices on diversity of soil bacterial communities in this uh, International Biosphere Reserve in Sri Lanka. So we have selected three types of land covers in this area. Uh, one is relatively undisturbed forest and then uh, regenerating forest after clearing the land for uh, shifting cultivation and then sites under active shifting cultivation. So uh, these three types of land covers were selected for the study and we collected soil samples from zero to five and five to 10 centimeter depth classes. Um, you can see the lo location of samples in this map. And when we were collecting soil samples, we used 10 meter by 10 meter quadrants and five samples were collected per site to make a representative sample of the site. And the information on vegetation cover was also recorded at the same time. The soil was used for characterization first by analyzing chemical, physical, and microbiological properties. And then uh, by looking at the data, we decided to use only zero to five centimeter depth class for molecule analysis because of the financial limitations. We could not process a large number of samples as we have used the metagenomic approach. So we collected, uh, we extracted DNA in triplicate from each soil and then uh, pull uh, the triplicated uh, DNA extracts to represent one site and then perform metagenomic analysis using next generation sequencing technique targeting V3, V4 region of the 16S RRNA gene. And applicant size we used after trimming was 250 base pair. So if you look at the soil characteristics, um, it is clear that the zero to five centimeter depth uh, has been, has showing uh, more changes uh, in the properties that we have measured with respect to the land cover. So uh, for example, the active carbon content, the bulk density and soil electrical conductivity these properties were affected by the land cover type at the zero to five centimeter depth, more than five to 10 centimeter depth. 
and potential nitrogen mineralization, which is an indicator of the uh, microbial, uh, one side of microbial functionality in the soil, also shown changes with respect to land cover. So with this information, we have, hypoth uh, we have hypothesized that uh, the, uh, the change, the microbial di community diversity uh, would change with the land cover type at zero to five centimeter depth. And uh, the active carbon, which com uh, comprise a major component of uh, the soil carbon, um, which is a major soil carbon fraction influence and interacting with the um, soil microbial community is, uh, has shown significant correlations with electrical conductivity, bulk density and potential nitrogen mineralization rate. So let's move into the bacterial diversity information. So from the sequences we have generated in this study, uh, after quality control, we have uh, recovered more than 75% of the sequences which is a good um, amount in next generation sequencing technique. And the refraction curves indicated that the species coverage obtained from each sequence run was verb to optimum and species richness for each site was exhaustingly sampled. For taxonomic assignment, we have considered 97% similarity uh, at 95% uh, confidence interval. And uh, on average, only about 16% of the sequences were assigned up to genera level. So there was high rate of mismatches, uh, which is common in next generation sequencing technique. However, this may lead to miss, uh, miss some important biological signals of novel species as well. So uh, this 16% uh, of the sequences identified rep were represented by 84 different genera. Let's look at the alpha diversity measurements. So we have calculated the Shannon and Simpson index. Both Shannon and Simpson indexes, indices indicated higher values for the soil from um, bacterial diversity in soil from uh, relatively undisturbed soil compared to regenerating forest and the shifting cultivation. So uh, the high bacterial diversity and less species dominance was there in the undisturbed forest soils compared to other two land covers. So if we uh, look into detail about the species composition, Actinomycetale, Bacillale, Clostridiale and Burkholderiale were the commonly found bacterial orders in all soils. However, the abundance of members of Actinomycetale were higher in disturbed soils. And if you look at the Actinomycetale order and look at the different genera present, um, Actinoplanes were more dominant in soils under shifting cultivation than in soil under forest cover. These are just a few examples to show that uh, the, how the species composition may change with the uh, land cover in this forested system. So if we take a look at the order Bacillalis, the genus Bacillus was the most uh, dominant genera in this order. And the uh, dominant species in uh, genus Bacillus um, are indicated in this uh, graph. And if you look at Bacillus megatherium and Bacillus primulus, they were found only under shifting cultivation in this particular study. So uh, the beta diversity was also calculated. So in this study, we have looked at both forward and reverse primers, uh, forward and reverse sequences as a quality control measure. And the, uh, the results from forward and reverse sequence analysis for regenerating forest and for shift, uh, soil from shifting cultivation were more similar. However, in undisturbed uh, forest systems, the results from forward and reverse sequence analysis were slightly different. Uh, there was a slight difference in that analysis, which indicate uh, some uh, interferences in the data um, analytical steps in this platform. So, uh, however, when we look as a whole, we can see that Samples came from sites in active shifting cultivation was significantly different from 
the samples that came from relatively undisturbed forest and the regenerating forest soils. So what uh, our study indicated is, in conclusion, the forest soil with minimum anthropological soil disturbances harbored the highest bacterial diversity at genus level and less domination of single genus over others in soil bacterial communities. And high mismatches in sequence alignment may be partly due to the fact that a large majority has not been previously reported and may have novel species as well. So it may not, on, not necessarily totally because of uh, the, the data analysis errors in next generation sequencing. And also disturbing the forest ecosystems in Hurulu dry mist evergreen forest in Sri Lanka for cultivation has reduced soil bacterial diversity. With this, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, Professor Pushpa Kumara, uh, Dr. Renu Kartanayaka, and Mr. Bhagya, and the assistance provided by a number of uh, people in this study, and the financial assistance from Biodiversity Secretariat of Ministry of Environment, Sri Lanka. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Washi, for that really clear and interesting presentation. And just to highlight the impact, obviously, of uh, uh, land cover change on, on soil uh, microbiological communities. Uh, so, um, again, if anybody has uh, any questions to the last presentation, uh, please now uh, add them to the chat. Uh, so, we have about um, 10, 15 minutes maybe uh, of, uh, of time for, for discussion uh, and questions. Um, and I see uh, already that we have some, um, uh, some exchanges in, in the chat, but uh, maybe I'd like to just pick up on one for uh, Sarah, uh, based on the, the very first presentation, um, where you were talking about the difficulties of um, assessing the success of restoration programs. So how would you actually go about uh, uh, quantifying the, the success rate of, of a restoration project? Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, apart from these biological indexes, uh, we obviously we need to include soil physical measurements of these sites. Uh, in the case of post mining sites, soil organic matter and decomposition and water holding are very important. And they could give you good indications of the status of the restoration in these sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a second. Uh, so uh, there was a question to Raul as well about uh, the the impressive increase in uh, total organic matter uh, content after the restoration process was very impressive. Uh, but um, can you say anything about the other soil properties like, like the stability of aggregates uh, and so on? Yes, uh, in the paper uh, that I said that the results were included, we also studied the electrical conductivity and the results again were similar of uh, compost amended soils with natural soils. But now I pasted uh, several uh, papers, now with the new project that is already uh, going on, uh, where we are performing many uh, physical and chemical uh, analysis. So there is more information from the new study area of physical and chemical parameters. About uh, the stability of aggregate, we haven't already done it, but it's true that we, we would like to, to buy the, the, the wheat sieve machine to, to perform this kind of analysis too. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's also a question to, to Daniel in that uh, the degraded pastures do not allow natural secondary forest regrowth in short uh, period. Um, and if you also need additional interventions such as cover crops, uh, do you have any research information about this information, about these interventions, and how to accelerate the recovery of degraded lands? Mm, yeah. Uh, the, the Amazon have a different coverage, and in the depend of the coverage, uh, you, you have more difficult uh, to, 
uh, to, uh, to threat that the, um, the, the pastures uh, can uh, restore it through the time in short of in long time. Uh, in this case, our, uh, our study are in the north part of the Amazonian. Uh, is, uh, they have a uh, very, very high influence to the uh, Andean Amazon Piedmont. And this influence to in, in, a, in a short time, we, can, uh, we have a, a, a high restored in all communities uh, uh, for, um, in, the, in this site. But uh, it's important uh, to know uh, that the, um, the connection uh, biological uh, uh, between natural fragments and these uh, uh, pastures and, uh, and degradate uh, coverage uh, have a, a good connectivity uh, for the, all the species uh, uh, can um, mix it in, in these matrix soils uh, for a better uh, um, re recovery of, of, the, of the biological community. I, uh, from Juan, I shared uh, two publications of uh, our institute that, uh, that, that show not only in the soils, uh, in the so many biological, uh, biological, uh, biological components, uh, all um, we can uh, restore it these, uh, uh, these communities in a short time. And wh what is the world practice uh, for you can uh, make uh, in, the, in the coverage with the communities and, uh, and, the, uh, and all these uh, connective, uh, biological connectivity in the coverage for half a better results in, the, in a short time to restore all communities. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, uh, um, just a general question, maybe to all four of the presenters then, I mean, I think you've all demonstrated that your approaches work and, and are successful. Um, have you had uh, any positive feedback, say from policymakers or planners that uh, they see then the, the greater potential of, of your approaches? Again, it relates a little bit to the upscaling uh, question from the first session. Uh, do you have any positive feedback, let's say, from uh, beyond the scientific community of the work that you've been doing? Maybe we start with, uh, with Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Arwen. Um, yeah, I would say that for the mining in industry, it's very important to get to prove the long-term sustainability of these uh, rehabilitation strategies. So I think there is a lot of hope in, um, in the role of these ecosystem engineers on um, soil fusions to be able to demonstrate that long-term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Daniel, okay, you, you're working with mining as well, but it more in a, in a rock quarrying than, than on, the, on the metal deposits maybe of, of Sarah. Do you have a, a similar sort of experience? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that uh, I, I agree with Sarah and, and, and all soil microfauna, not only the ecosystem engineers, but the uh, guilds of all my, uh, soil microfauna that, uh, that can improve the, the, the restoration in, so, in, in, so, in very coverage degradate. Uh, and all these uh, 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 mix it between the soil microfauna with engineers, the predators, uh, umivorous, herbivorous, and the uh, micro, uh, microbiological component, uh, and uh, also a uh, micro and mesofauna uh, can, uh, uh, can show it uh, so many things about uh, we can restore it or we can uh, 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 all the tools we can uh, make, uh, uh, I include politician tools, uh, technical tools and social tools uh, for made uh, more uh, efficient uh, to rec uh, recover it, the soils uh, that is degraded. And all these components uh, are very uh, useful uh, with uh, all the, the studies that my partners uh, make today. Uh, show that these results that the biodiversity uh, soil biodiversity is very important for uh, see the the state of the 
uh, uh, of the soils in degraded states and natural state and all these uh, um, consequence restoration ages. Okay. Um, Raul? Yes. Uh, here in Spain, the regulation says that mining companies must restore uh, degraded soils after their activity. And that's why we are working with the Themex uh, company in this uh, experiment I show here. And about the administration, there are, uh, we have two more projects. Uh, we are restoring soils that were uh, agricultural soils that were abandoned some decades uh, ago. And now we are restoring them. And administration is really, really interesting because it's in public uh, forest. And also now we are studying uh, how the soils uh, evolve after important um, perturbations like fires. There has been an important fire here in, in the province and we are working together with technicians of the administration to uh, make a, a follow, to follow the evolution of these soils. Mm -hmm. Okay. And finally, uh, Warshi. From, from your perspective, what's the involvement of the, the policymakers and the broader uh, community uh, to your work in Sri Lanka? Yes, um, this study that I presented, uh, it, is it was funded by the Minister of Environment, which indicate the keen interest on soil biodiversity as well. Until very recently, I would say about um, five years back, um, all the biodiversity communication <laughs> even the policies, regulations were only about above ground uh, vis visible diversity. That means like plants, animals, and insects. However, uh, soil biodiversity was recognized as an important um, component in biodiversity conservation measures uh, with these uh, studies. Actually, we were able to show the immense diversity in our soils um, in terms of bacteria, and also we did uh, study the fungi, fungal diversity in these uh, dry sun forested soils, which I did not present here. This indicated we have uh, very much uh, rich diversity in Sri Lanka, which is underexplored. Uh, There's so much potential and the ministry is really interested. And now we are formulating even the biodiversity policies, amending it with the information that we generated through these studies on soil biodiversity. So this was kind of an eye-opener event for the ministry to acknowledge the soil biodiversity and what these organisms might be doing in our ecosystems. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, I've just been scanning through the, 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 the chat and I see that uh, actually a lot of the questions have been answered in, in, in real time uh, during the, the presentation. So thank you very much for that engagement by, by, by all of the speakers. Um, so I think we've come really to the, to the end of the, of, of the session. Uh, I, th I think it's been a fascinating two hours. I think it's been a very positive two hours. I think it's really enlightening to see the, uh, let's say the positive demonstrations uh, of the work and really to show what we all really know in our hearts that uh, you know by by considering the bio the biodiversity and the life in the soil uh, we actually do end up with 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 better with a better healthier soil and i think all your presentations uh, and including also the the four in the previous session uh, clearly show that and, and and the benefits that they bring uh, to uh, to society as a whole uh, so um, I, I just like to uh, express my um, my appreciation for your work in the preparation, uh, in in uh, your presentations, and and in keeping to time, and in uh, engaging with uh, the more than uh, 120 people who have been following this session. So it's really good to have um, that number of people, much more probably than uh, if we were in a in a physical meeting. Although. It's always much nicer to be face to face uh, with you all. Um, just the colleagues uh, from FAO have asked me just to just to remind you of a uh, of a few things before we close that um, that the uh, the presentations uh, will be available 
on the symposium website uh, after the, the meeting ends and the, the meeting this afternoon was recorded, so you can always uh, listen back uh, to that. Um, uh, certificates of attendance will be granted uh, for people who have followed the four days of the symposium. Uh, and uh, if you need one, you can just uh, write to the Global Soil Biodiversity Symposium mailbox. Uh, and it's in the addresses in the chat there so that uh, you can you can request that. Uh, and then also just to remind you that the poster session uh, is still ongoing. Uh, so please uh, take a moment to uh, browse through some of those posters. There's a lot of interesting material there uh, uh, and uh, give your uh, um, the same votes of appreciation to, to the posters. So um, again, uh, I just remind you uh, again, in the chat, there is uh, from Erica, the offer to, to maintain the conversation and the discussions going through the web-based cafe. So uh, please uh, feel free to, to join that. I encourage you very much to do so. Uh, so again, I'd just like to thank you very, very much. Uh, and we'll see you uh, back in the symposium at uh, one o'clock tomorrow. Okay, so have a good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to all.